morning. Um, thank you so much. I hope you're enjoying your day so far at HEV University's World of Tomorrow Conference. My name is Talia Malatsky. I work in student life as a student life coordinator. I'm also the program manager at GPAS, which is our master's in advanced trauma studies. Um, it's nice to see everyone here this morning. So this morning's session will explore the role of media and arts and play an influence in society and how it shapes opinions in the world of tomorrow. I personally was a music major, so I'm actually very interested in the arts and seeing what this is going to be like when I was in Yeshiv University several years ago. Um, so it's my if you're in the wrong session, now's the time. <laughs> media and the arts. Oh my goodness. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce you to our esteemed panelists this morning. Michelle greenberg Coburn, on your right, is the director of the Indie Film Clinic at Cardozo School of Law. Before joining us at Yeshiva University, Professor greenberg Coburn served as the Dean of Students at Columbia Law School. Very excited to have her here. And on your left is Dr. Jacob Weiss, who's director of the Yeshiva University Museum and also the Associate Professor of Art History at Stern College for Women, where he has headed the art history program since 2006 and is co-chair of the Department of Fine Arts and Music. So please enjoy the session on media and the arts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Talia. So um, first thing I want to say is how, um, how delighted I am to meet you through this right. panel. We, right um, we are um, two components of Yeshiva University that are, I guess, off campus um, at Yeshiva University Museum in Cardozo. And, um, and I think we're, we're delighted to be part of this conversation. Um, and we see it very much as a conversation. Uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about what we do, how it relates to the broader picture of Yeshiva University, how we see that in the framework of this world of tomorrow. Um, and I think we're going in with a very strong caveat that we are not covering everything about media and the arts, uh, but just touching on some of the issues, and we look forward to getting feedback and conversation from you. Right, and really, like, we're happy to speak, but we'd much rather be able to tailor it to questions or thoughts or comments that you have, so please feel free to jump in. So, um, so I'll, um, I'll start, and, and uh, by way of um, really uh, telling you a little bit about how um, I approach this issue in terms of the, the two roles that I have at Yeshiva University. One is as a professor of art history um, based mainly at Stern College for Women, but in the last uh, few years I've had um, the great opportunity to teach um, here uh, at Yeshiva College, and I think that's an issue that is in itself interesting that um, art history, the program of art history, and, and you have uh, someone here who's uh, taken some of that art history, is a program itself that is based at Stern, not at Yeshiva College, and of course that, that sort of touches on a larger issue, but um, that, um, that uh, way I, I would sort of uh, speak about my, my, my role as an art historian, what I do academically. Um, my other hat at Yeshiva University is, is as head of the Yeshiva University Museum, where um, we do wonderful exhibitions, programs, educational initiatives that bring to life Jewish art and culture to the broader public, of course, channeling Yeshiva University and our larger academic intellectual um, enterprise, but we are really a public museum. But the, the really the key to those two roles that I wanted to, in a sense, distinguish um, and leading into this discussion with uh, Michelle is, um, on the one hand, looking at um, the role of meeting the arts, um, as it were, um, idealistically or inherently as an enterprise, what one is doing when one is engaging with the arts, and the other is from a pragmatic point of view. Um, in other words, what are the tools, what are the ways that um, studying or engaging with the arts allows you uh, sort of advantages or tools in the world of tomorrow? And that is the sort of issue I just like to touch on first, um, then to go a little bit to the inherent idealistic issue, and then, and then, um, and really, uh, uh, and then hand it over to Michelle to talk about the issues on, on her end and, and how she sees these in terms of the projects that she, she looks at. Um, so, you know, in terms of the um, pragmatic side of things, um, I will say that often when one is meeting um, parents of prospective students at Stern and at Yeshiva University, um, there tends to be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, what is the value of studying art history? And I think this is probably something that um, other fields, uh, not just at Yeshiva uh, face, but in other in general. And I want to make a case in a very brief way for that value, and here I'm speaking about its pragmatic value. And I'm not speaking about the value of studying the arts or of art history specifically, and I'm not speaking about the value of um, pursuing the arts or art history towards uh, becoming a museum director or curator, or if you are very fortunate to be able to teach uh, at Yeshiva University art history, but rather 
the pragmatic value that that gives you in the larger world, and especially the world of tomorrow. And I was reflecting on this um, in the last uh, week, actually just this past week, Walter Isaacson um, came out um, with a new biography on Leonardo da Vinci. And, um, and I think this is um, an interesting um, point to look at an artist uh, like Leonardo who, um, when, you, when you sort of look at his work, and I think uh, Walter Isaacson is a good example of, of how he brings it to life because Walter Isaacson is not an art historian, he's not an artist, he's uh, a journalist, historian, biographer, he's best known for his uh, biography on Steve Jobs and I think there are interesting relationships between Steve Jobs and Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, but he makes a case for, and I think uh, a very potent case, um, for the skills and values that the example of Leonardo da Vinci offers you um, in the world. And I think to some degree he is talking about the world of tomorrow. And I wanted to just touch on three aspects of the example of Leonardo that, um, that might be framed in um, sort of the endeavors of how things are changing in the future world. The first aspect is, um, is an idea of curiosity. Um, and this is something that I think is very much invested in the artistic enterprise. Um, artists, and I think the idea of looking at the arts in a larger framework, is an idea about being curious about the world. And Leonardo is, in a sense, probably the most monumental example of this. Uh, he is known um, for, as you probably know, having sketched, written about, designed uh, practically all manner of things under the face of the earth, from military equipment to um, engineering tools to having studied anatomy. Um, and in fact, um, really, if you look at his own view of himself, artist was very much at the end of that. Um, in fact, there's a famous letter that he wrote um, in the early 1480s. He was born and lived around Florence. And this was a period when um, where you belonged civically was very important. He wrote a letter, basically a job description, to the Duke of Milan, Ludovico Sforza. And in this letter, um, he lists all the things um, all these skills through which he could be of value to Ludovico. Ludovico Sforza, who was running a city, Milan, that had basically been in war, at war with Florence. And it's sort of a remarkable thing in the, in the context of this period when people had very strong nationalist civic identities, that's what it meant to belong to a city, that uh, Leonardo would be basically offering up his services, uh, probably on behalf of his, um, of his fellow Florentines. And he lists all kinds of things, um, his ability to build bridges, uh, weaponry, um, down this list. Number 10, the last on this list, oh, and by the way, I can paint and do some stuff um, you know, with a paintbrush. Um, and um, it reflects uh, this idea of the wide-rangingness, which you know, we've often sort of termed in the, in the phrase Renaissance man, this, this sort of universal perspective. But I, but I think really curiosity is, in a sense, one, one other way to look at it. The idea of seeing oneself um, not in any distinct uh, specific profession, per se, or uh, sort of from one uh, uh, standpoint, but really within the broader framework of what happens under the sun within the world. And uh, his relationship to the arts was related very much to how he saw his relationship to other endeavors as well art and science, uh, art and engineering, art and these other things really go together. Uh, I would say for me, this, this is an interesting uh, way one could think about how one um, needs to be curious professionally. One needs to sort of adopt uh, a flexibility in terms of our professional standpoints now, which, which are, I think, not just in museums and the arts, also in a much more flexible framework. The second thing that I think Leonardo offers um, is um, an idea of observing things carefully and closely. And this is something else that uh, he is really a, a monumental example of, but I think that also serves as a sort of larger uh, example of what one does as an artist or within the arts is looking at things closely, carefully, observing things, not just in order to reproduce them in paint or drawing but um, in order to engage with the world, uh, to engage the world visually, auditorially, in terms of what one sees, one how, how one experiences. And the other um, sort of value that I think Leonardo brings to life is the idea of indulging in fantasy. Um, the, um, I think the, the professions that we now see ahead of us, um, and again, I'm referring here outside of the arts world, um, are ones that are expanding, changing exponentially. Uh, we cannot predict what they are, and I think in some ways universities that are, um, you know, uh, discipline by discipline 
offer one model of that, but I think the idea of thinking artistically, where one is allowed to indulge in the fantasies of what goes on outside of the traditional way one looks at things, offers in fact a very good case or a, a, a good, a strong value for how one can, su can succeed in the world of tomorrow. Um, if you think about startups, technology, uh, things that are not as they were in the past, um, this type of artistic mindset, I think, offers a great example of how one can succeed. So this is uh, what I would say is on the pragmatic side, uh, on the side of offering where the arts uh, allow you some, some entry into the professional world uh, um, and, in, and as a su successful model. But I think um, inherently uh, there's an even more powerful case to be made for um, the arts and its relationship uh, in particular to what we do at Yeshiva University and, um, and the perspective that Yeshiva University offers. And um, if, you, if you heard um, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs speak, one, uh, one particular note that really resonated is this idea he was speaking about really asserting the importance um, that while we are engaged with now this broader universal community and the um, two billion users of Facebook, uh, he asserted the real importance of, um, of engaging with the local community, with uh, the teacher, the chaver that is uh, here with, within our midst. Um, however much online and long distance learning will be of practical value, there is the, the case to be made for its, um, one's engagement with the here and now. Um, and I think about this uh, in relationship to uh, the world of the arts, especially now um, looking at the museum. Um, there is a, um, I think, a, a, a strong case to be made for technology in the world of the museums. And um, we are um, at Yeshiva University Museum uh, now, uh, just opened an exhibition on the Arch of Titus, uh, where we've used a remarkable replica that has been recreated from the spoils of Jerusalem panel from uh, the Arch of Titus. Uh, using uh, digital technology, uh, a remarkable computer numeric carver to create this image. Uh, the ultimate goal of this, it will expand um, the way that people can experience the museum, but ultimately it leads you to the engagement with works of art, works of art that allow you to experience these sort of monumental um, moments of creativity. And I think um, this for me really allows us to engage with one of the core uh, aspects of humanity. And if you look back to prehistoric times, um, it was really the arts that uh, forms one of our most distinct um, aspects of the human experience. Uh, before writing was created, before text was created, you have, uh, against all odds, these remarkably creative uh, um, sort of experiences that are sophisticated, that are embedded with themes, that are embedded with ideas, so um, in many ways, I would say that the engagement with the arts allows one to engage at our core with what it means to be human. And I feel this resonates very much with the broader idea of what Yeshiva University offers, the idea of engaging with Torah and Mada, the idea of engaging with Jewish text and broader, one calls it perhaps secular, but it's really a broader idea of learning. Um, and I think um, arts in many ways, um, however one weighs visual culture and textual culture within Judaism, which is of course something that Rabbi Sachs has also weighed in on, the idea of engaging with the artistic experience is in a form of engaging with the core of our universal human values. So in that sense, there is nothing that can um, perhaps expand our uh, sort of yeshiva university perspective and I think the perspective of tomorrow more than engaging with that ideal of an artistic mindset um, and what it means to be an artist or a creative force as a human being. Yeah. So that's my um, sort of, uh, those are my thoughts and, um, and I uh, look forward to sort of engaging on these and other issues uh, with uh -huh. you. So, so poor Jacob, right, is on a panel on media and the arts with a lawyer, right? So you always have to wonder, like, how did that, how did that end up? So, um, so um, it's been really a delight to get to know you and get to meet through this panel. So if nothing else, that was really a wonderful gift to me. Um, so I'll tell you how a lawyer got to be on a panel about media and the arts and um, my perspective on it. And you'll see that we're coming at it from very different places but I think ending up at the same essential set um, of values and set of eyes with which to engage um, with the world. 
Um, so for um, so for many years, I taught and was the dean of students at Columbia Law School, and I would say the central. Um, question that I engaged around was really how, was really a question of impact, right? If we're launching lawyers on to, into the world, how do we think about the impact that lawyers can have? Um, and through that, sort of lots of discussions, lots of thinking about that, lots of engaging with every issue that hits the world first begins to royal a campus, so you spend a lot of time thinking about all different kinds of issues. Um, I developed um, what was considered a pretty in innovative course called Leadership for Lawyers. And of course, the joke was it was just leadership for people. But we had to call it leadership for lawyers in order to teach it at a law school. And began thinking about like what's the set of skills that we can use to really have impact and to allow law and business and all these other professions that we think of as very siloed from questions of social justice and creativity and the arts, and how we can sort of partner these things together and move it, and move it forward. Um, and I think someone heard me give a talk about using transactional law and negotiation, which is another set of skills that I teach, um, to move the social justice needle. And that began sort of a process that landed me at Cardozo, where in addition to founding the Center for Leadership there through the Center for Corporate Governance, I teach and direct the Independent Film Clinic. So what the Independent Film Clinic does, other than literally being the coolest law class taught in the United States of America, um, and probably the world, is, um, is we represent filmmakers and other people who are really thinking about how to use the visual arts to move the social justice needle in some way. And we actually help them bring their art to fruition. Art is no longer, it was not in the time of Leonardo, and it is still not divorced from questions of law and business, right? It is virtually impossible for an artist to, um, to send her message out there unless someone along the way has helped her out on the legal and the business side. And, um, and that was true of Leonardo, which is why he put his skills as an artist last in his, in his long list. Um, and it's right, then you really had a patron and you had less concern about intellectual property. Um, but now really thinking through these questions go hand in hand. And, um, and for me, really the ability to think beyond the silos of these are the people who are creative and these are the people who are not creative, these are the people who are doing good and these are the people who are doing well. And, and placing everyone in those silos and assuming that you actually make choices, right? And I think it's particularly complicated for, um, for young people when they're idealistic and they really want to think about their impact of the world, on the world to feel like they have to make a choice between the doing good and the doing well, right, um, in the world, between expressing themselves in a creative way and in sort of settling down and doing the thing that you're supposed to do in order to move forward in the sort of within the four worlds that we've defined. Um, so what the Independent Film Clinic does is represent filmmakers who are just trying to tell a message. And you can no longer tell that message unless someone has helped you figure out whether you have a right to tell that message, whether someone's going to sue you if you tell that message, if you've negotiated with all the different people along the way who are part of helping you make and send that message. And what's particularly interesting is actually the cost of making art, and in particular the cost of making film um, has gone dramatically down, right? So I always joke, I have, um, I have four kids between the ages of nine and 19, and I always joke that like the nine-year-old actually has basically all the tools available to her to make an excellent film, right? But actually the legal costs have, have gone through the roof because no one's willing to take on the legal liabilities and the um, amount of knowledge you need to have, the specialized knowledge to think through the whole range of issues um, has gotten very complicated. So it turns out to be an excellent way to train students and young lawyers to think about the broadest range of issues that will happen, and also to allow them to really be partners in the creating of art and in moving the social justice needle forward. So what we've found, and really what I, the questions that I sort of think about, the animating questions that I think about, are, um, what are is, is what are the messages that are out there and how are we moving society? And increasingly we are a visual society, right? So a huge chunk of the folks that we've come to represent recently, a number of sort of big institutes that think about it, the Tribeca Film Institute have others, have reached out to us because anything that you think of as traditional print media, the New York Times, the Washington Post, when you go to their websites, right, there's a lot of video content now. That video content didn't, it was not there five years ago, 
right? So if the New York Times is trying to tell you a story visually and increasingly trying to tell you a story visually, then they've entirely moved their model, right, for how they think people are engaging with them, right? So I love to curl up on Sunday morning with my old school newspaper and flip through the whole thing without a screen, but I am a dinosaur in this particular, in this particular way, right? So, and the people who are telling those stories are actually short documentary filmmakers, right? Journalists are short documentary filmmakers who are under uh, attack, I would say, on several sides, right? All these big giant media outlets want to take, a, take their intellectual property from them and own it. There's questions of, um, of finance, right? If that didn't cost someone very much to make, right, how much do you really want to pay them for it? There are lots of other people lining up to do this work. Um, and in terms of access to stories and access to justice, there's a huge amount of First Amendment and free speech issues. Um, and journalists are increasingly finding themselves under attack, not only outside the United States, but inside the United States as well. Um, and thinking about what can lawyers and business people do to empower those stories to be told is actually, I think, one of the animating questions of our time. Right? Not what role do we have necessarily in only making art, but role do, what role do we have in, having, in letting the stories that are being told through art, empowering those stories to be out there, right? both as consumers Right, and thoughtful consumers, but also like taking the whole set of skills that we have available to us and really using it to empower, um, to empower artists and, and filmmakers. Um, so, um, so for me, as I sort of think about this particular work that we do and where it fits into the mission, so over the course of the year, um, we took on a film that right now is actually playing downtown and at the Brooklyn Academy of Music where um, a documentary filmmaker um, had read about a so-called school of last resort. School of last resort is often established as an alternative to the juvenile justice system, right? Where you would otherwise be sentenced into the juvenile justice system and instead you end up sentenced into, um, into, a, into a school. So a judge in Missouri found himself sentencing the children of people he had sentenced into ju the juvenile justice system and established the school of last resort, right? So the schools to prison like sort of pipeline is its own question, right, which this touches upon. But there's a whole other piece here about access to justice, access to good legal representation, race, and real questions, right? My children would, the protagonist that they ended up focusing on is a young woman who did very well in school. She got into a second fight and then was expelled from school and ended up in the school of last resort. My child has access to better legal knowledge, right, to better representation. She is white. The chances that she would have ended up in this, in the same, in a similar position are like slim to none, slim having left the building, right? Okay, so, um, so it follows, this filmmakers follow the story of this young woman, and over the course of the story, you see that she is struggling to graduate high school, which is her and her mother's dream. She meets a guy, they fall in love, they have a baby. He gets into a program that, um, trains young men in construction work, which is good paying, good paying jobs, in order to sort of lift them out of the cycle of poverty that they're in. In the course of the film, he ends up jumping into some friend's car. It turns out the car is stolen. He didn't know that. But he pleads guilty to a, to a felony in order to receive a suspended sentence and go back to work to continue to support his girlfriend and their baby. And um, of course, he is no longer eligible for the for the work program because he is now a convicted felon, right? He pled guilty without, without um, any representation also. So what's amazing about the story, in addition to the fact that this is happening sort of across the United States, is um, the story takes place three miles outside Ferguson. And in the middle of following the story, the, the events of Ferguson erupt. There's no better way, there's no more moving way. So this film premiered at BAM last week and is playing downtown now. There's no, and of course, the indie film clinic and the students' names who worked on the film is in the credits, which is pretty much the most exciting thing that can happen to you if you're a law student. Um, that might be the most exciting thing that can happen to you if you're a law student. So um, if you're trying to tell a real story, a lawyer, a law professor, um, a professor who is talking about justice, like anything you can do at any school at yeshiva can actually not tell that story and have more impact than the way that documentary filmmaker 
did, right? Even just telling it to you orally, right? You really begin to think about what this story might look like. It's a real human lens. And this is true of sort of all the kinds of stories we care about and all the issues we think about. So the clinic took on a number of stories in the immigration space. They do a lot of work around women's issues. They do a, we, do a, we take on a number of films that are thinking about complicated international issues. Um, and as, um, as we're telling these stories, the thing that actually really resonates for me is often um, I feel that um, we have seeded our role as observant Jews in taking really strong stands around the issues of social justice that impact us in the United States and us in the world. Right? They're complicated, they're messy, we spend a lot of very important time thinking internally in our own communities, right? although these issues are never divorced. Right? If civility of discourse is falling away at the international level and at the national level, it is surely falling away in our community. Right? If questions of um, how we treat people based on educational and other backgrounds is something that we're seeing nationally and internationally and is surely impacting us in our community as well. If questions of sort of separating the arts from the professions is happening outside, it's certainly impacting us as well. Materialism, name any issue, right? We're not, we're not immune to it. But I think we've really um, let our voice, like the very important voice of the Navi, who was always thinking about the Atom and the Almana, right? Always thinking about the orphan and the widow, right? And the reason the prophets were always focusing broadly on the orphan and the widow is the notion that there are those who live among you who are actually not technically your problem, who um, represent those who are most without privilege and most without protectors, right? And calls upon a society to think hard about what it looks like to protect those, right? And when we're thinking about who we are as a society and really who we are as observant Jews, it's very easy for us as yeshiva to nitpick, I think, about um, ritual and to move away from thinking about the larger animating questions of where we want to be in terms of an ethical and a moral compass. Um, and when we think of the role that artists can play very much now, I would say in particular visual artists are playing in sparking um, local, national, and international conversations. I think thinking about the role that art has played traditionally, right, and I think that's why Leonardo is like such an interesting example, the role that art has always played, and in particular the role that art can play now when everyone is an artist. You just have your phone. You can do anything with that. And in particular, everyone is a filmmaker, right? So when you're thinking about those series of questions, really important questions as to who owns the ideas that you create, right? Who owns them and how are you going to think about them, both in terms of their impact and in terms of monetizing them? That to me seems to be like the series of animating questions where the, the more traditional ways we've thought of art and uh, the new ways we're thinking of of media and social justice really begin to to um, to engage in a very sort of elaborate and complicated conversation. So, um, so it's so it's so interesting because um, I think I maybe mean, there are two two issues that you know I think what you say really resonates with how I how I think and I think really the uh, the example that the arts makes. Um, so to you know to the the first issue that you raise about Leonardo that while. Um, well, well, I'm on a first name basis with, right. as is Jacob, obviously. Yes. Well, that's you know that's that's one of the it's one of the joys about you know actually engaging with these people is this is how he's he's sort of referred to by scholars when when it sort of makes no sense to say Da Vinci because it's sort of a place name, but yeah. So Leonardo, we can refer to him as Leonardo. Um, while on the one hand, um, he does represent a very different example than, than using the arts for social justice, because of course, Leonardo, like every artist before him and like every artist after him, up until the 19th century, was not in the least concerned, nor was there any such concept of social justice. And if there was, um, or if there was, it, it was not in the arts world. Um, but the other, the other flip side of that is sort of comes out of questions one often gets from um, students or it's sort of a perspective that students often have is that art exists um, in some abstract way for one's enjoyment or for one's appreciation as, as is the idea that one gets from going to museums. And in fact, that is not what the arts was about for its entire history up until the 19th century. 
So it very much resonates with what you're saying because in fact arts was a practical concern. It was a practical concern to say things, to do things, to move the needle, and if one can um, compare moving the needle on behalf of the Duke of Milan and moving the needle on behalf of social justice, I, I know that sounds like a stretch, but, but it suggests that arts uh, was always, from its prehistoric days up until the present, a practical tool. It had a utilitarian value. Now, that's one aspect of it. So I think you're, what you're saying so eloquently about its, its, um, its value and its, and its um, powerful value on, on now on behalf of social justice is, is so resonant. The other side of that um, is that um, there is, I, I do think one can make a case for the dis difference between what I would call more everyday, let's say, if it's documentary filmmaking and storytelling and artistic filmmaking. And, um, and that is the value that um, makes paintings like the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper and the great masterpieces before and after so resonant is that they, they have more than just a utilitarian value. They have something that speaks to the, our soul. They speak to our essential value as human beings. And they have a uh, sort of magnificence about them that lifts them to a level even on the value of utility. So I think this is where I would argue that even um, arts as an intrinsic, um, aesthetic, um, sort of human skill, if one achieves it and practices it at its highest level, it actually will achieve things like social justice at an even more practical and effective degree, right? That, that the greater... Right. It perhaps, certainly opens up conversations, right. right, in ways that other things can't, right? There is, there is some sense of ability of people sort of across cultures and across differences to engage, like positively and negatively, but to engage right. with particular so, pieces of art. And, and we've been, we've been um, discussing this very issue at the museum where we, we, um, we opened this Arch of Titus exhibition and we created this replica. So um, there was what I would call as a sort of more mundane film version of the making of this panel that was playing in the gallery. We recently um, created what I would call is a much more successful work of art, which is about the making of this panel, which, um, which is only in draft form. It'll be in the gallery next week when we, when we have a conference. And um, if you compare these side by side, it really does speak to what um, art as a form can do to sort of tell stories. And I think it just leads very much into the remarkable issues that you're working on, is that it has this powerful uh, tool to convey messages and have resonance beyond just the, the sort of point by point storytelling. Right, and I think the tension between the pragmatic and the utilitarian and sort of these higher questions of soul and humanity are actually, you know, really, right. uh, really both a tension and something that I think we see very much sort of as Absolutely. in service of each other. Um, we are totally happy to take questions, or the two of us can, you know, keep, sit happy up, drink to, our right. coffee and hang out. Yes, can you just tell us your name? Uh, my name is Jonathan Blank. I'm wondering. I have a, a, just a quick observation, which is that Rembrandt spent a lot of time um, painting poor people, and, 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 mm -hmm. and maybe he had an interest in social justice, maybe not. So I'm going to just actually <laughs> say I wanted to push back on that point okay. also. I think that there is a way, but okay. Um, but my point is really quite different. I, I'm wondering, we, we, in, in a lot of discussions, there's been discussion of Saddle in the university. I'm wondering whether you think, well, I'm wondering to ask what you think whether there's any attempt on the sort of secular faculties, especially the secular graduate school faculties, to engage the rebellion, who seem to be entirely in their own and without any interaction between themselves and the, and the, and the, uh, um, the, the secular pursuits of the university. And if, if you're really so siloed, I wonder whether the mission really is the mission I'm, I'm happy to take on that very light question uh, and very, very valuable question, absolutely. Um, you know, so I've, I've, I've had, um, uh, and I'll speak to this from, from the, my, my recent experience. Um, f first off, I would say one of the things that really surprised me about teaching, I, I was trained as a Western art historian. Not, I did not train to do Jewish art history. Um, my field is in Northern European Renaissance art, a very non-Jewish field. 
Um, and I, uh, you know, I wrote a book on city painters in the Burgundian Netherlands. Uh, there was no Jew anywhere there. It's a New York Times bestseller. <laughs> right. It's yeah, soon to be. Um, so um, I had, um, I have to say, uh, I was you know teaching and, and came to YU. Um, it was it was not um, a school. That, that is on the kind of art historical map of what one would do within a traditional sort of art historical pursuit. Um, I was convinced to come here by meeting the students. Um, in fact, it's you know, probably one of the most um, you know, great things that, that we deal with at Yeshiva University and sometimes you know, sort of one of the, um, so, so some can be sort of uh, complicated things that students are really given a great place here. And in fact, as part of my interview process a little over 10 years ago, I was interviewed by the students, uh, in addition to the deans and, and other people as well. And it was the students that really convinced me to come here. And, and what ended up being, um, you know, playing out, uh, which is something that really surprised me, um, so I, I come from a sort of tr traditional Jewish background, but that was not part of my art history. And what the students here um, really do is um, they deeply understand what the longstanding meaning of art has been, which for the most part has been a spiritual religious uh, goal. And I think you could trace that back uh, thousands of years and you could trace it up to the, you know, again, uh, to the Renaissance at least, past. Um, art was done uh, its greatest points for the uh, idea of raising our hearts to the service of God in whatever capacity one defines that. When you teach, and what I found in teaching at a non Jewish at a non-YU school, there tended to be a kind of more skeptical view of what that meant. And clearly, um, I, I, I taught, and many other people would have been teaching in that context, um, you know, observant Christian and Islamic and Jewish students. But the kind of sense that when you talk about uh, art for the service of God, you kind of roll your eyes and you think, well, what is that you know, really? Come on, that's, that's the old world. And I feel... Really, when you meet the students here, and, and I experienced it for years teaching at, at, when I was teaching only at Stern, they understood that. And of course, you often, in teaching Christian art, which is a lot of what you do when you teach uh, um, you know, uh, anything after, uh, you know, uh, anything in the common era, you have to uh, educate people on what the stories of, of that is, but they get, they appreciate, they understand, and it resonates with them. Um, what the goal, in a very sophisticated way, what the goal of the art was. So that's, that's just one point I would like to say. Um, in the last few years, I've had the opportunity to teach with uh, Rabbi Meir Soloveitchik um, classes here and at Stern that are interdisciplinary classes. So we've done two such classes, one on the image and the idea, and one on Rembrandt and the Jews, as it happens. And those are taught um, in a way um, from uh, not distinct entities, but I approach it art historically, and he has approached it theologically, philosophically, these various issues. And um, what um, it strikes me that while this may maybe not every um, you know, uh, non-Jewish studies person has the opportunity to do this, but it is something that can only, has only, I think, can only happen here. And, and, and what has also been eye-opening to me is that it allows a field like mine, which can often be sort of um, reduced to sort of academic questions of, let's say, when such a painting was painted by Rembrandt, or was it actually painted by Rembrandt or someone else, into larger theological questions, which are very out of fashion to, to deal with in other universities. So um, I will say that it probably you have to find the right people to do it. Not everyone is as open to engaging with um, you know, people who are not doing Jewish studies or traditional yeshiva study. Um, and maybe a lot of what goes on are the sort of two components of you know, Jewish education on one side and uh, sort of the broader. But the fact that they are ha happening in proximity and that you do have these points of engagement. And I think uh, what Michelle is talking about to me also represents some of that engagement as well, I, I do feel is, is happening. Um, maybe it could happen more, but there are certainly points of engagement. All right, so I'll just add to that. So I'm very new here, but um, I very much feel like the, like 
Rabbi Berman and so on are really very interested in the work that we're doing both in the leadership center and in the clinic and thinking broadly about the ways we can we can bring that to the larger university and the second piece and I think that's not only uh, it's, it's a really actually I think nice moment that's happening more broadly but also within the Jewish community is really being able to have a conversation about sort of the ethics and morality of all the work that we're doing and how we can think about the direction that that takes and it finds particular expression at Yeshiva University as a real question of Torah Manda. So I actually am very heartened by all of, by all of that. Thank you. Can I yeah. So I'm Selma, Selma Lott and I'm the provost of the university and just to respond to the question as well. So I think that um, higher education in general in the United States is very analyzed and so faculty um, tend to be resident in the disciplines that they're trained in. Um, I think we have an opportunity with Rabbi Berman to break down those silos. And so it's not the secular faculty engaging the rebellion, but it's rebellion um, engaging the faculty and faculty engaging, so it's a dialectical. Uh, and I think we're in a moment where we may be able to do this, because if we say the rebellion do one thing and the secular faculty do another thing, then we are not, in fact, honoring Torah Umada. Mm -hmm. We just do one thing here and the other thing there. Um, so I think that's that's an exciting moment for us right now. Right, and you do see more and more of that. Like, I think people are very open when I call them, and I get all sorts of interesting calls, and there's different ways to think about that. Um, yeah, and, and I found at the museum um, in the last few years we've done an exhibition on the Eruv in New York in the modern day, on Shemitah, on the Arch of Titus. Uh, we are, we have the REITS faculty who are there, um, who are there, you know, giving shiurim in the case of Eruvin. Uh, in the galleries are halachic letters and works of art by contemporary artists who may not know much about the sort of early history of the Eruv in, you know, Roman era Palestine, but um, there is a dialogue going on between um, sort of arts and the sort of uh, traditional religious texts. And I do think that there are many people from our community, and I think increasingly, I hope, under uh, Rabbi Berman, that'll, that'll bring that to life. Yeah. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? I have a question. Jacob, um, do you think with the digitization of the world, mm -hmm. including of the art world, there will be a drop off of people going to visit museums and actually looking mm -hmm. at, the, at the work of art. And I'm thinking, you know, with the advent of the iPad and so forth, I, I, I happen to love libraries. And I've gone to all the libraries of New York City, right. it's true. So I go to the library to get a book because I want to yeah, yeah. support libraries. <laughs> But I worry that kids buy things online, they don't go to the library, mm -hmm. and their parents do the same. Do you find there's a corollary in the museum world? Um, so look, I, 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 I speak very much to the engagement that I have as, as dinosaur-like with libraries and reading physical newspapers. Um, it has been, um, it's been a big point of discussion uh, among, um, you know, I guess the curators, museum directors, who are e even sort of a generation slightly you know, older than me and, and certainly ones younger than me about this, this question. Um, all museums um, are, and I'd say broader cultural institutions are, have to, and, and for their survival are using uh, tools of the internet. I mean, they have, um, uh, you know, they have digital departments, they have uh, you know, social media departments. Um, I would say, I'll speak to what has been found in the broader sort of research of these issues, and then I'll speak to my own sort of sense of it. The broader research of it, it's been found to have the opposite, that um, generally more people are being engaged, and I think probably um, sort of people that um, Michelle was speaking to before about people who might not have had access to museums, who might not have had the experience of museums are now able to surf and look at um, images, uh, you know, what it was like, you know, even to prepare an art history class or to look at to look for paintings. Um, when I started being a teacher, is so much different now, where you can easily access anything, and that is the, the experience of everyone. So um, the general experience has been, I think, rather in 
expanding the numbers of people who are able to engage at a very high level because you know Google images and such things allow you to see things often better than you can in museums is really remarkable. And the flip side of that is it's been found that it hasn't hurt museum attendance uh, and but rather sort of boosted and allowed that to expand. On the personal side, um, I can just speak to um, that there is nothing like the experience of engaging with an object. And that's not something I think that is, um, that will change generationally. I do think um, the side that maybe you didn't touch on, but I think is, is embedded in your question is, what happens to our, um, our skills at observation when so much of it is sort of quick um, sort of social media type interaction, if it's you know, the form of a tweet or other forms where things happen very quick, it, um, it perhaps lessens our, um, our um, not ability, but our practice at engaging with works of art, which is a, an intense experience. And so that part of it, I think, is, you know, is possibly a, a threat. But I don't think that we will ever lose the power um, that engaging with books or physical things, and especially works of art, that um, on, on, on many levels, uh, both because of their um, remarkable uh, beauty and, and compositions, but also because they are the original objects. And I think they allow us to have a a direct link back to that moment of creation which will always be appreciated. I think possibly we will have to pay a lot of attention to how we emphasize that and how we encourage those first-hand experiences, but I don't think it will ever leave. Right. I'll actually say, I think for me, there's a piece of this that's sort of one of the animating questions I think of the next, I would say, 10 to 20 years will be, what is real? I think this is actually a tremendous question. Like. What is real news? What is fake news? What is, you know, what is um, a documentary? What is reality TV? I often tell, like, when we're trying to do trainings broadly, and we do it all around the city for filmmakers, so I tell them there's sort of a continuum between narrative. We used to talk about narrative and documentary, right? But now there's a continuum, like, what is reality TV? Is that narrative? I always tell them, how, how much do you need to take a shower after you've watched that to sort of give you a sense of where you fell along the continuum? The more you need to take a shower, the more close it is to narrative film. Um, so, so I think that these actual questions, right, what is virtual reality and how do we engage in virtual reality? If any of you have had like a VR, a virtual reality experience, again, engaging through like the New York Times or one of those other platforms, certainly it's something that museums are doing more of. You have a sense that there is an attempt to reach mm -hmm. the 3D-ness okay. of, um, of being in a museum without actually being there. So I actually think there's a couple of really interesting questions about that, right? There is, every study says that the more access you have digitally, the more you actually, when you come to New York, want to see the real thing, the more you want to come to New York or go to France and see the real thing. So I think that's really interesting. But for why you specifically, I think we're in a place to talk about two very critical pieces of this. The first is, how do you think about the quantity of community versus the quality of community, right? Because we can build, I don't know, many more people than are in this room can watch this at some point, right? What do we think about the quantity as opposed to the quality of community and engagement? Um, and I think in particular, as a community that often still takes a break from the digital world for a period of time, we're often a control. And the joke among my many friends, there's this joke at Columbia that I started the digital Sabbath revolution, where I challenged everyone to see if they could shut off their devices for five waking hours a week, right? And, um, and anyone who's done that and tried to do that will tell you both how incredibly difficult that is and how like their ability to engage in the things around them change so very dramatically. And for me personally, right, and um, we have many, we have family meeting once a week, and once every three months, the thing that comes up in family meeting are new device rules, which are often prompted by our children telling us what their parents need to do with their devices, right? So, um, but then I don't have a problem putting it down for Shabbat, right? And, um, and understand the difference in that quality. So I think thinking about this issue, right, how much do we allow 
reality and virtual reality and how are we thinking about that continuum and also thinking about the quality of our own engagement is um, is it we're really actually quite well positioned to do that here in a unique way and I think that's one of the ways that the museum is thinking about it and that lots of other lots of other folks are are engaging with that question in all different sorts of sorts of ways that I heard questions and the last couple of questions dealt with faculty very much and the first initiative. But uh, Jacob's comment that quite convinced him to come here was the students and the mm -hmm. students' questions. Mm -hmm. So my question is, in the objective of looking at the uniqueness of what the university can provide in the world because of the constituency of how much uh, of the thinking incorporates what students are actually feeling and thinking to determine what we want to do, whether there should be a, something on the archetypes because there's a faculty person who brought a group there mm -hmm. and understands the art. And now we say this is what the students need. Mm -hmm. The question is where, how much student initiative is there uh, or encourage and will be encouraged to chart the direction mm -hmm. of the university or not. Basically I'm saying users mm -hmm. have a lot to say on what's presented if things are to be used. Yeah. Um, so I'll just say in terms of what we do, um, so there are many, 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 many filmmakers who would like to be clients of the indie filmmaker and of the indie film, of the indie film clinic. The students make those choices entirely, like under, you know, I'll sort of weed out the people who I don't think will offer pedagogic value. But besides that, the issues that we're thinking about and the kinds of work we're engaging with are all ones that the students themselves choose and are focused on. I'll also say, and this is um, one of the wonderful, really amazing things about the Cardozo student body specifically, is because the intellectual property um, program is very highly ranked and the clinical program is very highly ranked, there's a huge number of students who come to Cardozo who themselves have some art, filmmaking, music background. So I had a student who had to miss class because he won a Clio for a digital piece of music that he put together it's actually a wonderful PSA around not texting and driving, and he composed a piece of music made up of the text that people were sending, unfortunately, at the moment that they passed away. Right? So there's um, the, the amount of high-level sort of filmmakers and, and artists that I, that I find at the law school. Right? Though I do point out to them that their risk profile is very different from their clients because they were filmmakers and chose to go to law school, and the other people <laughs> decided to stay as, stay as artists. Um, so I think they actually drive the conversation. They choose the subjects we're going to think about. Um, they took on a big project around actually the early history of video art. And I'm sure the museum has never shown this, but the early history of video art is actually virtually unwatchable. But they felt that it actually had a lot to say about the digital world in which we find ourselves. And so it was an important contribution for them for them to make. So, um, so I really am sort of following my students and find that their interests are broad and really thoughtful. They're also 10 steps ahead of where I'm at in terms of their engagement with the world, both uh, visually, right? They're just really so far. I'm, I always say I'm a digital immigrant, and they are really digital natives. So I'm always going to speak with an accent. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think my experience um, resonates with that. Um, I, um, I, I, I run the art history department with my colleague at, at Stern, Dr. Marnon Young. So both of us are uh, sort of trained in sort of traditional, sorry, I'd say Western art history. He's a, a modernist, uh, focused on wonderful art historian, late 19th century post-impressionism in France. Um, we began uh, sort of creating our program based around a fairly traditional foundation-based art history program that you could find probably at a lot of liberal arts universities. Um, a cycle of classes that would involve a combination of um, surveys for entering students or students who are just taking it for a requirement to a range of classes from you know early ancient art to contemporary art. Um, and over the last um, seven, eight years, we have integrated a number of classes that are, I would call, influenced as a kind of Yeshiva, they have a yeshiva university character. Um, and those, I think, have happened largely because of student a kind of, and I wouldn't say it's pressure, but it's from a sense that um, we wouldn't really be serving, we wouldn't really be teaching the subject of art history in a, in a fully rich way if we weren't engaging with these issues. I'll give you just some examples. We are still teaching these, these sort of more traditional classes, but 
Uh, we introduced a class called The Image of Jerusalem, uh, which is a class that uh, I developed with uh, Dr. Vivian Mann, who was a longtime wonderful uh, curator at the Jewish Museum, uh, looking at the ways that the image of Jerusalem has been presented by, uh, by Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Um, these classes that I mentioned before, these interdisciplinary classes on the image and the idea, on Rembrandt and the Jews, uh, we're actually developing another one, uh, uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik and I, on, um, which is tentatively called um, Holy Moses, Moses in Art and Jewish Thought. Um, so these are classes that, um, and what's, what's striking about them is they are not, they do not compromise or um, uh, sort of take away from sort of art history at its highest levels, they rather they expand on it and they allow you to combine it, as, um, as, uh, as was said before, um, with the sort of larger concerns of the university uh, that come from the Rebaim through other faculty as well. So I think it's, it's really a, it's kind of a wonderful um, opportunity that we have. So I think we are out of time, but Jacob and I are gonna sit here and keep talking yeah. to each other. So um, we're happy to answer any questions that people have. Um, and we really are very appreciative of your actual real life engagement <laughs> yes. um, with us during the course of today's conversation. Thank you all yeah, very thank much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.